week of a six-week survey through the book of Ezra. It's a book that, that shares the story of life after exile. And when we left off last week, we saw that God's people were celebrating his goodness and that his love endures forever as they threw a party after establishing the foundation, after completing the foundation work of, of the temple. And so I invite you to grab your Bibles and join me at Ezra chapter 4. That's where we're picking up the story today. Now, if you're using the Bible in the rack in front of you, the page numbers are listed for you in your program just to make your life a little easier. And, and as you get to Ezra 4, I also want to remind you that the, three, the first three episodes in this series are available for you on our website, on our Facebook page, and on our YouTube channel. And I want to point that one out because actually, sermons going all the way back to, do you remember the series we did on marriage a few years ago in 2014? We did a series on what the Bible, some of what the Bible has to say about marriage. And so every sermon from today to all the way back through those sermons is available for you on our YouTube channel. So wherever you are and whenever you're available, you can connect with the, the biblical ministry of Prince Street Church. And we want to make sure that, that you're aware of that. Well, Ezra, chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building the temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, Let us help you, because like you we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of some guy I don't know how to pronounce, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, You have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. Then the peoples around him, around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They hired counselors to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Now, I want to pause there because I need to fill in a few blanks. If you recall, the nation of Israel was once made up of the 12 tribes. But unfortunately, after Solomon's reign, uh, there was a break in the nation. The 10 northern tribes uh, created their own nation, their, other, their own northern nation of Israel, leaving the southern two tribes of Judah and Benjamin to form the nation of Judah. Well, in 722 B.C., remember, this is not... This is not an analogy. The book of Ezra is, is, is not a, 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 a spiritual tale. I mean, this stuff is actually set in real life history. And we know from history that in 722 BC, Assyria conquers Israel. Now the Assyrian approach to, to putting down conquered nations is different than Babylon. Babylon took people into exile. Assyrians brought Assyrians into the conquered nation and arranged marriages between themselves and the people. The reason they did that is because in one generation, they were able to mix bloodlines. They were able to begin destroying family identities and tribal understanding. It was really quite effective. And it's not just Israel that Assyria did this with. This was their standard operating procedure for... Um, for, for bringing conquered peoples to their knees. Well, when the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem reaches, when the news reaches the northern territories, um, tension is set up. Scholars, to be honest with you, scholars aren't exactly sure of the timings and all the details, but one thing is certain is that um, the people around Jerusalem are not at all happy that the temple is being rebuilt. And they do everything possible to stop progress, in, including lobbying and political shenanigans. When Cyrus dies, an opening emerges for these northern territories to create havoc in Jerusalem. They write a letter to the new king, king by the name of Artaxerxes, about the long history uh, of the troubled past with Jerusalem. By the way, they don't need to exaggerate. 
The history of Jerusalem has been a, a conflicted history for a very, very, very long time. And so the letter goes to Artaxerxes, and it's successful. Artaxerxes issues an order that the work on the temple in Jerusalem is to stop, and that it's not to start again until he specifically gives the order. Fifteen years go by. For fifteen years, no work on the temple takes place. By then, there's a new king in Persia. His name is Darius. And that's where we pick up the storyline again, now in chapter 5. This is Ezra chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Now Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, a descendant of Iddo, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, son of Jozadak, set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, helping them. At that time, Tatanai, governor of Trans-Euphrates, and Sher Shethar Bozani and their associates went to them and asked, Who authorized you to rebuild this temple and restore this structure? They also asked, What are the names of the men constructing this building? But the, eyes of the, but the eye of their God was watching over the elders of the Jews. And they were not stopped until a report could go to Darius and his written reply be received. Now remember I told you that Artaxerxes issued the command that work was to stop and it wasn't to start again until he said so? Well, here's what I want to point out. It isn't because an order comes from the king of Persia that restarts the work in Jerusalem. Instead, it's God's prophets announcing God's word that gets God's people back to work. You see, the ministry of a prophet in the Old Testament isn't what we typically think of when we think of a prophet. When we think of a prophet, we often think of somebody who, who foretells the future. And to some degree, prophets in the Old Testament do that. But the primary role of a prophet in the Old Testament is to proclaim the word, of the, God, uh, the word of God. He speaks for God. By the way, if you have never read the books of Haggai or Zechariah, this week would be a great week to do that. Haggai's only two chapters. Certainly we can all find time this week to read two chapters. Uh, Zechariah's a little longer, but it's not very long, so you can probably read both of those. So the work... On the temple restarts because God's people respond to God's word. Of course, that doesn't make the people in the northern territories happy. This guy named Tatnai and his buddies, they are, well, they are sort of the, the, the king's eyes on the ground. They're the ones who are noticing what's going on, and when they do, don't you love the power trip they play? Who told you to get started? Give me your names. We're going to report you. And so the names go, but the work does not stop. Why? I love the wording here. Because Tat and I and his buddies might be the king's eyes on the ground, but look what it says. It says, God's eyes, the eye of their God, was watching over the elders of the Jews. And every time a, a, an issue of sovereignty take pla takes place, God always wins the sovereignty battle. Doesn't matter how powerful an earthly king is. Hear this carefully, because we worry about earthly authorities way too much. God is sovereign over every earthly authority. Amen? So let's not get ourselves so bound up the next election cycle. All right? God is sovereign. Sometimes he even puts sinful pagans on the throne to accomplish his purposes. I don't understand that, but it's the Bible, so there it is. That's all extra material. Just because I love you, just jot that in the margin, dig that out sometime later this week. Now, where was I? 
Ah, oh, yes, the eyes of God were on his people, and so the work continues until a report could be sent to Darius. When it comes back, guess what happens? Not only has Darius double-checked the records back in Persia and found Cyrus's original decree, he issues this order that the work should go on, that Tat and I should make sure it happens, and guess what? Also fund the, pro the project. Brian, wouldn't that be cool? If the government funded all the church's projects of redoing windows, wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> we think that'd be cool, too. Uh, it's not how he does it, though. It doesn't seem. All right. Well, let's fast forward in the story just a little, a little further. We're now at Ezra chapter 6, verses 14 to 16. So the elders of the Jews continued to build and prosper under the preaching of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, a descendant of Iddo. They finished building the temple according to the command of, God, of the God of Israel and the decrees of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, kings of Persia. The temple was completed on the third day of the month of Adar in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. Then the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the exiles celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. So the work on the temple has been completed. It has been a long, emotional, risky, and very difficult task. Along the way, multiple setbacks have occurred. Three different kings have reigned over Persia. And although the Jews have been allowed to return to Jerusalem and rebuild this temple, the fact remains that they are still slaves. They are still subjects of Persia. But finishing the work of the temple deserves a celebration. And so extravagant sacrifices are offered. The priests are installed in their divisions. The Levites in their groups for the service of God and all of this, as you read the whole story, you'll see that all of this is done in accordance with God's word. Clearly, God's people had learned the lesson of exile. That walking faithfully with God is not just a good thing, it is everything. So, how does this story from so long ago connect with our lives today? I mean, the work that we're doing to preserve and protect these beautiful stained glass windows, it's important. It's important that we do it well. Because how we practice stewardship of these facilities that God has entrusted to us in our generation, it is an expression of worship. So it's important that we do this well, and we will. But this building, as beautiful as it is, it's not the temple. Since the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, God no longer resides in buildings. He resides in bodies. We covered that ground last week. If you missed it, I, I encourage you to go back and take a listen. Now, God resides in us individually. God resides in us collectively. Nevertheless, I see a connection between this story from so long ago, this story from Ezra and the story of our lives, and that is that God has given you a work to accomplish. All week long, we've been pouring into the kids at Vacation Bible School that they are special because God made them. We've been telling them that God is on their side. That God is always with them. That God is always for them. That God will always love them. That they were made for a purpose. And my friends, that's not just true of kids. That's true of all of us. All of us were made for a purpose. God created us uniquely. And he has a plan for each and every one of us. God's word tells us that before we were even conceived, think about that one. Before we were even conceived, God knew us. God loved us. And God had a plan for us. We 
We have a work to accomplish. Here's some of what the Bible has to say about this. This is Ephesians chapter 2 at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Oh, my friends, let that sink deeply into your soul. Each of us is God's workmanship. That means each of us is a masterpiece because God only makes masterpieces. Amen? Yes. You are a masterpiece. No matter what the world tries to tell you, no matter what the media might try to tell you, no matter what cruel people or even cruel parents might have spoken into your life, the truth is that God has made you for a purpose. You are a masterpiece of his grace. Thanks be to God. You're important. You are known and loved by God. Created and gifted to accomplish those things which he's given you to accomplish. But that doesn't mean that the work is always going to be easy. No, as we walk in the good works that God has prepared in advance for us to do, we will face opposition. And sometimes that opposition comes from the people around us. Our ancestors of the faith experienced that themselves. The people around them weren't at all happy about them stepping into the work that God had for them. They even manipulated political structures in order to get the work to stop. So we shouldn't be surprised in our own day. When we, res when we experience resistance and opposition from the people around us. Sometimes that's our neighbors. Sometimes that's our friends. Sometimes it's even our own family members who just don't understand. And who even disagree with what we know God has called us to do. So although God has given us work, understand, sometimes there's opposition. And sometimes that opposition comes from those really close to us. At other times, the opposition is the result of spiritual warfare. You know, in his writing to the church at Thessalonica, Paul explains that it was his desire to come to them. And that multiple times Paul tried to come to Thessalonica. But he was stopped by Satan. My friends, when you step into the plans that God has for you, Please expect spiritual opposition. I say that not to scare you, just to make you aware of the reality. We have an enemy who is actively working against the things God has called us to do. And sometimes, sometimes that enemy even makes things come to a stop. So as we step into the work that, that God has called us to, we'll experience opposition. We'll experience it from the people around us. We'll experience from spiritual forces of darkness. And sometimes the opposition is internal. My guess is that many of us at some point in our lives have been in the same boat as our spiritual ancestors of faith. We got a good start going. We celebrated what God was doing. And then... The wheels came off. Work stopped. And now it's been a long, long, long time since we've even thought about restarting that work. We may even have convinced ourselves that there's no point in starting that work again. We might even have got ourselves to believe we shouldn't have started in the first place. So let me step into the shoes of Ezra for a moment. And announce God's word to you, God's people, in hopes of getting you back to work. Galatians chapter 6 at verse 9 says this, Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. My friends, God has not given you a work to begin. He's given you a work to accomplish. A work to complete. And I know all too well how frustrating the work can become. 
I know all too well how tiring the work can become. I know all too well the opposition that comes in our way as we're trying to take the steps that God asks us to take. I know all too well how much we want to just quit. But let me me remind us, God didn't call us to quit. God called us to finish, to accomplish the work he's given us to do. And even though opposition will come, we know that God is on our side. So let us not grow weary. For in due season, we will reap a tremendous harvest if we do not give up. So brothers and sisters, let me ask you a question. What work has God given you to accomplish? How's that work going? Have you allowed yourself to grow weary? Have you been facing opposition? Have you been forced to stop doing the work God called you to do? Have you you convinced yourself that there's no use to starting again? Oh, let let, let me remind you. It is never too late to start again. It's never too late to get back to work. It's never too late to get going again and finish the work that God has given you to do. For no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter how long it's been since you've put your hand to the task, no matter how many times you've stopped, God is still with you. God is still for you. God still loves you unconditionally. You still have a purpose. God still has a plan for you. And even if your choices have led you to a season of exile from relationship with God, because of Jesus' finished work at Calvary, because of his death and resurrection, it's not too late. Anyone and everyone who is willing is invited to leave the exile of the past behind, experiencing life after exile. And so as our musicians come to the platform, and throughout this next song, I I want to encourage you to, to reflect on God's word and interact with him. What has he been saying to you? To you? What do you need to do about that? During the song, maybe you'd like someone to pray with you. Or maybe you'd like someone to talk to. We're going to have folks in the back waiting to do that with you. Maybe you'd just like to be alone in prayer. The the prayer rail is available for you. Maybe you'd like to be anointed with oil. Jared's going to be available to you here to the side. Feel free to come and, and see him. He'll be happy to minister to you. Maybe you want to stay where you are and, and jot some notes for yourself. Maybe you want to reflect on the lyrics to the song, or, or maybe, maybe you even want to sing along. Whatever it is that God is calling you to do in response to his word, I invite you to do just that through the presence and power of his Holy Spirit. Amen.